I wanted to take a couple of minutes to show off the navigation system and how we can use that to help us with some of the reconstructive problems we run into in the cranium maxillofacial skeleton. There's a, there's a couple terms I want to start off with that are really important for us to understand when we talk about navigation. The first two terms are registration and tracking. And um, those are really important for you to understand the setup for this whole kind of system, which is really si simple once you get past that system. The first thing that makes this easiest and really hands down the easiest way for us to use navigation in the operative setting um, is using this thing here called the mask. This mask that you see is, that's already been applied to the specimen's face is a sticker. It's a big sticker. There's some little backing that you peel off it and you set it down. And what it has is it has a little bunch of LED lights on it that allow us to see the, see the face and see a representation of the face um, while we're working. There's a box that's attached to it, which is a power source, which drives the light for this. Now, when we're talking about navigation, it's very, very similar to the navigation system in your car, the GPS system in your car. You've got to have a map, and the map that you'll use, you'll feed into your car, is the equivalent of your CAT scan or your MRI. You need to have a satellite that tracks you as you drive around in your car. That's the eye up here. And then you need to have <coughs> the little bubble that communicates between the satellite and your car, and that is going to be our mask. So registration is the first step, and that's matching the face, the actual face, to the map, the CT scan. And there's tracking, which is the real-time movement, and being able to move the face as the face moves around so we can track different probes around the face. Now, when we, when we do the registration, the data set from the face has to match the data set from the CAT scan very accurately. And so if, for instance, you have a situation where you get a CT scan and a patient's very swollen, and the operation is delayed for a few days, the surface contours of the patient when they had their CT scan will not match the surface contours of the patient you're going to operate on, and that's going to make that registration not very accurate. You need the data sets to match. So you'd have a couple options. One would be to use bone data, which would then be very accurate because bone won't swell, or you could get a more recent CT scan, a more contemporary scan, which will then um, be a better match for the data sets. So you'll have a better registration. The higher the quality of your registration, the higher the quality and the accuracy of your navigation, and overall the better your case will, will proceed. When you um, <clears throat> get your CT scan, you need to get an area that captures more than just perhaps your area of interest. If you're going to do an orbit trauma case, you maybe think you just need a CT scan of the orbits and the structures around them. Well, if you do that, it's actually going to make it very hard to register the data sets. If you think of the face as a, a cloud or a bunch of dots in space, we can match up two clouds easiest if we've got dots in different planes of space and x, y, and z coordinates that are in, separated by space so we can match them up. So we'd actually like to have multiple points that are out of plane and separated by space. So if I only have the orbit, that space is very tall, short. If I have the whole head, then I'm separating more, I've got more contours, I've got depth, I've got width, I've got projection, all those things are going to make the registration more accurate. So in an effort to capture as much anatomical detail that you can that's really beyond necessarily your area of interest for your reconstructive plan, you need to capture enough anatomy to register the data sets. And to that end, you're going to want to get a CT scan that really goes to the vertex of the skull and at least down below the maxillary dentition. That's obviously going to capture enough area to put a mask on like this and to get all the detail, enough separation, enough points for an accurate registration. Um, it's going to, um, <clears throat> you're going to want your CT scan to be after the patient, is, uh, the swelling is gone. Um, and then you're going to want to think about how that scan is done. And, and most hospitals will now have some kind of navigation protocol CT. In our hospital, I asked for a striker navigation protocol CT, which is a simple non-contrast CT, which will run all the way to the, the top of the skull, down through the maxilla, the mandible if I ask them to. So I have all this anatomical detail available for my registration. Again, matching up the patient data to the CT data so that I can register. Um, <clears throat> I said that this mask is the easiest way to register, and really it is. Um, if you're going to change parts of the face during your operation, for example, lift a Weber Ferguson flap or retract a large part of the cheek, it's obvious that it's going to distort some of your LED lights down here, and maybe that could change your, your tracking and your registration. It's actually okay. Once you've used all these points to register your data set, you can cut off most of this mask and still track. All you need are the horseshoes up here to be able to track the movements of the head during the operation to maintain that link between the patient data and the CT data so it's useful during the operation. So a Weber Ferguson wouldn't preclude you from using the mask. Um, lots of lip or cheek retraction would not preclude you from using the mask for an orbit trauma case. 
Um, <clears throat> now, what would preclude you from using the mask for tracking would be a coronal flap. A coronal flap bringing the skin forward up and over this structure would obscure the LED lights from the eye so you wouldn't be able to use it. And in those instances, you're better off using the skull post. And this skull post, which I have here, looks a lot like the lunar lander, which will be fixed to the skull bone and act for tracking. Tracking being tracking your movements through the skeleton as you're working. You can still use the mask for registration, then use the skull post for tracking. <clears throat> this is going to be affixed to the skull with a single 2.0 screw, 6 millimeters, 8 millimeters in length, drill free. Um, you can either put this on after the coronal flap is elevated or you can use this prior to the coronal flap being elevated. In which, in which case, you'd make a little nick in the scalp with a 15 blade, go right down to bone. Then the screw is going to insert down the middle tunnel and you can see that it comes out of the post just like this. And then that, I can then find a, a nice um, spot roughly on the parietal bone where the bone is flat. And then using the drill free mechanism, drill the screw down. <clears throat> but that's only a single point of contact and that's not going to be very rigid and you don't, you want this to not move during the case. So the next part of this setup is that you've got these three spikes, three spikes. These spikes will then get pushed down to the skull and you fix them down with this wheel here. But before you do that all the way, <clears throat> you then want to think about how this tracking device is going to be set up for the case. Um, in general, you're going to want this to be facing the eye because these, these lights here need to be able to communicate. If you're blocking this with your body, if um, you've turned this so that they can't see, it's not going to work. The second bit of advice I would give you <clears throat> is to keep this thing flush to the skull. Keep it right on the skull. So if you bump it in the, in the, during the course of the case, you're not going to lose your registration. If this is off and you bump it during the case and it moves, you're going to have to re-register your patient mid-case, which can be a frustration and inefficient, obviously. So instead, what I usually suggest is you take this middle post here and have this rotated around where it's going to connect to the tra tracking device and have it so you can sit it flush on the skull, on the scalp just like this. The two devices line up and come together and they will then click together just like this once I get the bars lined up. Once these are lined up and it's sitting flush on the skull, you spin this wheel down the rest of the way until this is firm. But this hasn't firmed up yet the whole mechanism. This still allows this part to move. So you've got one last wheel to turn. So with this now sitting flush against the skull, I'm going to turn this wheel until it's finger tight. And then I'm going to fasten it down a little bit tighter with a coker. Get on it with a wheel like this. And usually just a couple more turns are going to be enough to really winch this thing down tightly. So that in the, pro in the midst of a case, this thing's not going to move. <clears throat> It's one extra step. It's a little more unwieldy than using just the mask. And if you can get away with just the mask, it's really the way to go. And it's going to be more than adequate for a TMJ ankylosis case, for zygoma osteotomy or zygoma fracture reduction, or for almost any kind of orbit surgery that you're going to do, decompression fractures or deformity or otherwise. Um, <clears throat> So the first thing that the, the, the navigation is useful for in the process of orbital deformities and orbital um, reconstructions is actually helping you out with your dissection. So once we've got our, our registration, once we've got our mask on, we're ready to do the registration, we're going to use our probe here. And the probe is going to act a lot like the mouse on your computer. Um, <clears throat> if you look closely at this probe, you're going to see there's a light system that needs to be able to see the eye and communicate to it. So when you're working with it, you'll need it facing back towards the eye. Secondly, you're going to see rows of buttons. There's a left side and a right side and they perform identically. They essentially allow this probe to be used by a left-handed person or a right-handed person. On the sides at the top and bottom you have an up and down arrow. These are to move the cursors around the screen and they simply clicking on them will do that for you. The middle button that stands up is, is like the mouse button on your is like the button on your mouse that allows you to click a, a, an action point on the screen. So in this case we want to now do a registration. So I could point this and hit register. And now using the LEDs, it's going to match the two data sets together. <clears throat> I 
so once you've completed the registration, you then want to verify the accuracy of your, of your registration. Um, and there's a couple ways to do that, but the easiest ways to do it are to touch some really solid points, points that you know are going to be reliable. So for example, the dentition. So if I touch this on the upper teeth and it matches, then I know that's a good reliable spot. Tip of the nose, forehead if I can, the uh, canthi down on bone, any uninjured spot, anything that's not going to move, gives me a pretty good idea if I'm accurate. I can touch the skin if I want, but skin is more susceptible to change. Skin, skin moves with pressure, so it's not going to be as reliable checking your registration. If you're happy with the registration, you're okay to proceed with the operation. If you're not, you then have different options to refine the matching, and you can choose bony points, you can choose soft tissue points, you can use a trace around soft tissue to gather more data to improve the data match between the patient and the CT scan. In this case, we're going to begin exploring um, a fracture. So this patient has a uh, orbital floor and medial wall fracture, which I created prior to this. And <clears throat> the, dis the um, tracking itself, the navigation itself, can make this process of dissecting one of these fractures much easier, particularly for the novice orbit surgeon. Um, simply by placing the probe, um, I can get a sense of where I am. And, and most um, surgeons, uh, as they begin dissecting orbits, particularly trainees, will think they're very deep in the orbit and they'll think they're very close to the optic canal when in fact they're actually quite remote from it. And I think this helps a surgeon um, adequately dissect a tumor, fully expose all the bony ledges for a proper orbit reconstruction. The second step and the second bit of utility with navigation when it comes to orbit trauma is in guiding your reconstruction and confirming the accuracy of your reconstruction. And that has different levels of fidelity, different levels of complexity. And the first and the simplest one that you could use would be after you've placed your orbital implant, you would use your navigation probe, place it on your orbital implant, and trace it over the implant. And in your mind's eye, decide if that's an adequate representation or reconstruction of what the orbit should look like. That doesn't take any special software, that doesn't take any special planning, that just requires you to put the implant in where you think it's best and then place the probe on the implant and make sure that it's on solid bone, not sitting in the maxillary sinus, not sitting in the ethmoids, and, and giving you overall the shape of the orbit that you want. A higher level of fidelity, which is actually very used in the software, um, <clears throat> is using mirroring technology. We're, we're able then to use the uninjured orbit to create a perfected anatomical data set to help guide us um, in terms of our orbit reconstruction. <clears throat> this requires an initial step by using a bounding box. And what we're going to do is isolate what we consider to be normal anatomy on the opposite side of the face, and in this case, the uninjured side of the face. So what you see here is we're creating a bounding box around, that's around the orbit. You want to include all of the orbit and just a little bit of tissue beyond it. You want to make sure that the bounding box goes back and includes a little bit of the anterior cranial fossa. Again, you're trying to get points and structures that are out of plane that help the, with the XYZ plane alignment of this structure, especially when we mirror it to the other side. <clears throat> so it probably take that bounding box just a little bit more medial in the, in the coronal plane so we catch that medial orbital wall. Yep, that's great there. <clears throat> and that looks pretty good. You might want to come a little bit further ahead in the sagittal just so we can get all the orbital rim a little bit more. We're just past the lacrimal system now. There, it looks great. So now we've captured all this anatomy. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to define what anatomy we want, we want to pick out. And what the computer does is it picks based on threshold segmentation or the Hounsfield unit density of the structure what it wants to mirror around. And so what you will do is you'll click on the bone and it will highlight the bone. That's why all the bone turned green. And then you create your, your mirrored image on the opposite side you'll see that it's automatically aligned the mirror image structure on the opposite orbit. You have the capacity to refine that if you need to, um, but you'll see in this case that the mirroring is actually pretty darn accurate. The second option that you have, if the mirroring is not good or you have an implant, um, several of the MedPore implants, striker implants, um, have been fed into the system as STL files. And in this case, you can see here, I've positioned a 3D Titan left orbital floor medial wall implant um, where I think it should fit ideally into the orbit. So there's a little bit of redundancy here. You don't need to do both. You certainly could do both to help guide your reconstruction or assess its accuracy. Um, but in this case, we've got a, a, a perfected anatomical data set based on a mirrored data set from the right orbit. And I've positioned an orbital implant exactly where I think it should be. So the next step in a case like this, after having already dissected the orbit, found solid bony anatomical margins to set my implant on. In particular, identified the posterior lip of the fracture. I will then go and expose the fracture itself. I will take my implant, which has been 
um, custom design for this defect. I will place it um, into the orbital defect. Make sure it's sitting on firm bone. And then really, I just take my best, my best run at it. Essentially, the way I would fix an orbit fracture if I didn't have navigation available. So I think I've done a pretty good job, but now I want to verify it. So I'm then going to use the orbital, the, the probe now, to verify the accuracy of this. And using my navigation data set, I'm going to place the probe on the implant. With the implant now in place, I will move my probe along the plane, on the implant, front to back, and looking at the sagittal projection, I can see that the probe is moving along my perfected anatomy. Oh, in this case, maybe my implant has slipped off. And you can see now the probe is in the sinus, suggesting that if my probe is on the implant, the implant's in the wrong space. That allows me to adjust. If it, however, if I move the implant along just like this, and the implant sits, and my probe sits on the implant, and the probe is where I want it, then I'm in a good spot. In most cases, what you'll find is that the implant falls off your posterior lip and sits in the sinus. Occasionally, you'll find that your implant is sitting too high and can be encroaching on the orbital apex, and you get, you'll have the opportunity to correct that before you leave the operating room. The second verification, then, is to then move along the implant in a left-to-right fashion, and this time looking at your coronal projection. So this time, as I move my probe along and look at the coronal projection, you can see that the probe is walking exactly along my planned reconstruction, suggesting that I've done exactly what I set out to do. If I'm satisfied with my reconstruction, I'm done. I can now proceed with the closure. This is really a simple step. Your setup should only take a few minutes. Registering the data sets should only take a few minutes. Verifying the accuracy of your, of, your, um, of your orbital implant placement should only take a few minutes. This should really be simple, should add very little to the case, but it should save you um, trips back to the operating room um, because you get the opportunity to correct on the fly. Thank you very much.